Hello and welcome to Modern Poetry in Translation Spring Launch. And today we're celebrating the launch of Fingers of Our Soul, the, um, the Body's Focus, with our guest editors, Jamie Hale and Karani Baraka. It's a beautiful issue, it's absolutely stunning. And um, we've wanted to do it for some time and many thanks to the Arts Council for enabling it, supporting it. Uh, and they're also supporting our current uh, writer in residence, D.L. Williams, who will be sharing BSL poetry with us over the forthcoming months online. Uh, so do look out for that as well. And the idea for this issue really came from something um, Ocker said in an essay uh, in 2018 called Open Wide Translation on the Vida website, which I really recommend you look up and read. It's a brilliant essay. Um, when she said, I see accessibility as always a form of translation. Um, and that kind of just expanded my mind hearing that um, and, and made me think about so many things. Uh, it was such a revelatory sentence for me. Um, and putting together this issue with Ocker, who brilliantly agreed to be a uh, guest editor, and Jamie Hale as well, has been an absolute pleasure. Um, and made all of us at Modern Poetry and Translation, I hope, uh, think much more deeply about different kinds of translation, um, whether we've had to um, think about putting the call out into plain text, or translating images into picture descriptions for the magazines, um, all these different sorts of translation, which I hope really enrich the issue. It's also, um, I mean, it's just, it's also just a gorgeous issue full of absolutely brilliant poems. So I'm gonna hand you over to our guest editors in a moment to speak about it in more depth, um, but let me introduce them. And first of all, I'm gonna introduce um, Karani Baroka or Oka who is a uh, disabled Indonesian writer, translator and artist whose work is presented internationally and whose latest book is the absolutely stunning Ultimatum Orangutan from Nine Arches, one of my favourite books of last year, and it's shortlisted for the Barbellion Prize. And um, I'm very pleased that Oka's here uh, tonight to introduce, our, or say a bit about the magazine and introduce our first poet, Oka. Hi, Claire. Thank you so much to you, to the MPT team, including Ed Cottrell, and of course, to my brilliant guest and co-guest editor, Jamie Hale. It was so wonderful to work with you. Um, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to do this. I, I think we had a blast. <laughs> um, so our issue begins um, with a quote. Scratching and stirring up desire are typical tasks of the kind of research that stains the fingers of our souls. Um, and that is a quote from, excuse me, from our poet, um, Angel Teron and the translator, Rafael Cruz. And I think that quote sort of encapsulates the exploratory <laughs> and um, uh, 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 open to interpretation nature of, of, of what we did. Um, so quoting from the editorial a little bit, uh, there's work translated from a range of signed languages, bringing with it visual interpretations of works performed in motion. We wanted to create within an ethos of equality between sensorial modes and welcome the opportunities to explore and experiment with publishing varied presentations. Um, and speaking of sensorial modes, a uh, bit of self-description, I'm an Indonesian woman with a choker necklace and a background of grass and leaves, and I'm wearing a patterned yellow uh, dress. We have distinctly privileged deaf and disabled poetics being disabled ourselves, living in a time of genocides against the most vulnerable. Through these poems and translations, we reach towards an understanding of deaf and disabled experiences, reflecting an engagement with a form and limitation of the corpus both as human body and body of poetic work. Ultimately, survival, living, and deep care for the world pulse through the poems we selected here, forming the veins of this issue. We hope they speak and sign to you with, as poet Angel Teron says, and Rafael Cruz translates, the fingers of the soul. Um, so now I'm going to introduce videos from the poet uh, Levent Beskardes, who uh, is Turkish and works in French sign language and his translator, Stephanie Papa. So take it away. We were so taken by this translation. Uh, it uses a variety of sensorial modes and includes um, Levin's pictorial interpretation of the poem. Uh, and it was really excellent.
V. I see you dance vibrate before me, and I verge vacillate the pen that pivot jots on the blank paper. I see you dance blur in accelerated velocity, and I jolt the pen that quickly veer vaults vault veers. I see you waltz lang valorously, come and go velvet volleying on the paper. I see you Venus vanish dance on my vivid view paper of vitality. You give me your beauty, life to life, volant wave of our meeting of minds. Now I'm going to introduce our second guest editor, Jamie Hale, who is a disabled poet and theatre maker from London. They are a 2021 20, to 22 Jerwood Poetry Fellow. They've performed in places from the Tate Modern to the Barbican Centre and their first pamphlet, Shield, which is absolutely stunning and I would highly recommend, was um, published in 2021 by Verve Poetry Press. And Jamie is going to say a little about um, editing this issue and then introduce um, another poet, Jamie. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you to the whole MPT team for having myself and having Ocker, who I have long wanted the chance to work with, guest editing this issue. Um, I'm a I'm a white non-binary person. Alarmingly, I'm 30. I have dark red hair, a dark red beard, and enormous black glasses. I'm wearing a headset and a turquoise polo shirt. It was an enormous privilege to work with Oka in editing this edition. And I was very grateful for her absolute precision in wording that led to the wonderful editorial from which she read earlier. I think I find poetry of the body so fascinating because it is both about the, the most sort of specific and intimate experience that can exist of living within one's own, one's own body mind and yet also the most universal one of living within a body mind. And it was so wonderful to explore poetry from such a wide range of cultures and especially from the deaf and disabled poets and translators who submitted work, but also everyone else who lives in and writes from what is ultimately a mortal meat sack. Um, so for me, one of the things that was so wonderful was about this work existing in a journal about translation rather than in a specific silo or space made for disabled poetry. And in many ways, my experience of being disabled is, as in that wonderful essay of Ockers, an, ex an existence of translation, to be constantly translating my own desire for movement into an instruction for another. And I was really keen to find work that explored that translation of the intimate individual into a language that was broader than that. So as we went through commissioning, reading and discussing the work from so many poets and translators, the hardest thing was definitely narrowing it down. But I nonetheless ended up feeling particularly close to two of the projects within it one a translation I commissioned and one a translation that I was a partial translator of. And the one I commissioned was by Anthony Price, a talented British novelist I invited on board for this project because of the experiences he discusses of translating through the medium of predictive text and specifically translating through the medium of typing with one's eyes looking at a keyboard on the screen. And if disabled people are, as Alice Wong, again, an excellent writer and thinker, discusses the oracles of the future, then Anthony is writing in that way of the future, one which increasingly doesn't require the fingers of our bodies. And perhaps just as the keyboard was seen as mechanising and making the process of writing less intimate, the technology that Anthony uses, now assistive technology, will maybe be the intimacy of future writing. Hello, and welcome to what we are calling predictive poetry. 
My name is Anthony Price. I'm a 39 year old writer from Canterbury, and I live with a neuromuscular condition called spinal muscular atrophy. Quite often, when people like myself use a computer or any kind of technology, we use what we call assistive technology. This particular piece came about after a short conversation with a friend of mine who also has a disability and we were discussing whether we write a piece ourselves or whether we rely on the predictive text that often comes as part of the package with an on-screen keyboard, for example. Uh, I myself use an on-screen keyboard um, and I often use the predictive text because why not? It's quicker, it saves typing out the whole word. But that did lead to questions as to who actually writes the piece. Is it the computer or the person? So the idea was, was to take a original poetry, original piece of poetry and to rewrite that piece using purely predictive text. And the result is below. As you can see, they are different, but very, very similar. Here is my piece. I have a trim typewriter now. They think I know what one is better. It makes a pleasing rhythmical row. And neat is every single letter. I trick out stories by machine. Dig purr and gags and verses keen. And lays them off in manner slick. It's so easy and it's quick. And yet it feels false I'm afraid. Of giving satisfaction. This message of literature by aid of scientist traction. For often can't find what I need to see. The dash thing running around me. It bolts and does whatever it may. I cannot hold the runaway. It's not even been fit for the break. And endless are my verses. Not a yard I would love to make appropriately terses. It's plain that this machine, made screen, is only for machine to read. Now, I found that the original piece of this poem, um, quite a while ago, it was um, a short piece called My Typewriter by Edward Dyson. Um, and I found it to be fitting for this as Dyson is writing in a time where technology was becoming more mainstream and writers were using typewriters and not pen and pencil anymore. And much like myself, he goes through the, the question of who is writing it? Is it the machine? Or is it me? Um, so yeah, I found I thought that was a, a good phone to use and uh, I hope that you also enjoyed it. Thank you. So our next translator poet pairing is going to be introduced with a video by the translator Harriet J. Uh, and Harriet has translated, uh, first of all, Harriet is um, a disabled poet herself who lives in Ghent, Belgium. Uh, with poems published, you know, in Poetry Wales, Stan, The Real Tomasexia, many different places. Um, she was awarded the 2021 to 2022 Poetry School Scholarship for a Disabled Poet. And Harriet has translated the Flemish poet Maya Wojtak, who is also a director and an embodied arts performer whose work reveals in sensory experience. And here I'm quoting from Harriet's um, notes on the work. Now, she writes, uh, Maya does, performs and directs poetry films and stage productions, which include dance, music, and visual art, and explore the poetics of the speaking body. Uh, it's also written here that as a disabled poet, this is still quoting from Harriet, I relish the intense sense of freedom and physicality in Maya's work. And I hope all of you um, listening and, and watching this will also relish that sense. Thanks. Hello, I'm Harriet Jay, and I'm going to read my translation of Mutterdicht by the wonderful Maya Wirtak. Maya is an award-winning Flemish poet, 
performer and director whose work revels in sensory experience. She often incorporates dance and music into her explorations of the poetics of the speaking body. As a disabled poet, I really relish the intense and sometimes wild sense of freedom and physicality in Maya's work. In Muderdicht, she evokes a sensuous tenderness which embraces the act of writing poetry itself. I'll just explain the beautiful neologism of the title which I've retained from the original. Muder means mother. Dicht translates as close or intimate and also refers to the noun dichter, meaning poet, and the lovely verb dichten, to write poetry. Mutterdicht. Do you know where light was born? The first horizon. The soft pink of the first day. There, where time arose, where consciousness was cradled in an ocean of sensation, where breathless senses listened to themselves. A being in whom I can come into being, mother. As infinitesimal cells inside yourself, myself began. My body broke out in you like a storm, swarmed into form, became human. On your branches, my little heartbeat blossomed like secret singing, swelling into song a bursting forth inside the dark kiss of your internal embrace, like fruit, your growing flesh, like ripening trust, as you slowly sense the truth of your transfiguring and know yourself to be my swaying cosmos, my personal sea. Heavenly source where I began my earthly course of crashing of landing. Nine lavish months. You sang me into life, then laid me on the lips of time, so I might rhyme with waves and stars. Warmed by your sun, I am the sum of your devotion. Without your light, your sustenance, my stories would have budded dead Instead, the language of your arms was my first tongue. Soft sounds inscribed like smiles inside my skin. Your tenderness still clings to my limbs like ink. Inside the secrecy of your flesh, you whispered your wish. For so long singing, the heart inside your heart into song. This music dawned before words. That was a a striking translation when we first read it and I think even more so on hearing it like that, the idea of the body itself swarming into form, that kind of that building of a collective of cells into something so much more. So it almost thanks to both Maya and Harriet for that piece. I think the other of the two that I felt closest to and will be introducing was a translation of a piece by Sahara Khan about repetition. Sahara wrote this poem in British Sign Language and it was initially translated into written English by herself and Irina Drochek, a child of deaf adults and BSL signer. When I tried to work with the written text, the piece lost so much of what made it powerful in the vibrancy and change in motion, mood, tone, all of these things which were written into the original and which somehow became lost in the translation 
of something from the embodied movement of a body into text on a screen. And so for me, the process of translating a piece that almost already existed in translation was around trying to recapture the vibrancy and changes in the initial poem through typography, font and spacing, such that my edits to the wording were minor, but the structure, I hope, offers a new perspective on what it could be to translate between modes as well as languages. And I think we're going to see the piece from Sahara first. And one of the reasons for presenting that video without captions was to ask that you engage with it as a poem in a language of its own and as a poem so finely crafted in its use of structure and repetition as to slowly be encouraging its meaning to grow as you move through it. And to read the translation I wrote of it will lose so much of that because, again, we are now translating from the structured visual on the page into spoken English, which is almost a further translation. I don't care if it is repeated, repeated, repeated. Stop. Look at my hands. What's that? My sign. Understand? I don't care if it is repeated. Stop. It is sign language. Be quiet. For who? It is for everyone. But I am deaf. And you could also be deaf. I don't care if it is repeated. Hold on. Our rights, our culture, our language. Understand? I don't care if it is repeated. Stop. Look at my hands. Tell me, what's that? You nodded. My sign. Understand? I don't care if it is repeated. Stop. It is sign 
language. Be quiet. The it's a beautiful language. Stop. I don't care if it is repeated. Stop. One more time. Look at my hands. Last time I'm asking you. What's that? Your sign. Finally, you understand. I don't care if it is repeated. Look, it is sign language. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Jamie, for that stunning reading and um, to Sahira for a stunning performance. Um, just thought we'd have a couple of uh, questions while we have our wonderful guest editors here. It'd be nice to chat to you a little bit more um, before we finish. Um, so we, we haven't really spoken much about the fact, in, in, in when I introduced you, I didn't say much about the fact you're both translators, but you are actually both translators, as we heard Jamie there, um, and between languages as well as um, between different sort of modes as we were talking about then. Um, so perhaps it would be nice to hear a little bit from both of you about your um, translations you've engaged in, your sort of translation practice and, and, and what you think about the translation world at the moment, ways in which the question, I suppose, of who, who gets translated and who should be translated. Um, Jamie, what's your, your experience with, um, you, I know you've translated um, poetry before, haven't you? I have, yeah. Um, I think I came to poetic translation through a combination of loving poetry, learning Spanish, and being frustrated that the Spanish poetry I wanted to read was still something I felt I couldn't quite reach. And I think for me, translation has always been about that intimacy of reaching across a gulf and knowing you won't ever quite reach the other side, that there will always be something lost in that gap, but also that there will always be something gained. And that's why with maybe Anthony as a partial exception, the translation of poetry isn't a mechanical thing, but a human experience, because it for me was so much about finding the translator within the poem as well as the poet. So I've mostly translated from Spanish to English um, and primarily Nicaraguan poets, um, favourites of which include Yaconda Belli and Ernesto Cardinal, though both of whom already exist widely in English. But then one returns to the idea of the translator as also putting something of themselves into the poem which is, I suppose, why we are still translating some of the same ancient poets, because translation allows a fresh way of looking at, at something old. And that's how I've always tried to work with poetry. But I think maybe there's often a sense that the translation is the subordinate form of the writing, rather than it being its own process of writing and creation. And that's what, I guess, fascinates me about this world. Hmm. I think that's so interesting. And that point that it's important not just to have a diversity of poets being translated, but that the translators, to, it's important to who's doing the translating. Um, and that so can be less visible, that side of it, but how important it is to have disabled translators as, as well as disabled poets being printed. I think absolutely, how interesting. Um, Oka, I'm sure you have lots to say on this. Um, I think that I, I keep learning every time I translate or every time I, in this case, guess edit with the wonderful Jamie. Um, I, I also want to shout out, oh, it's going a bit transparent, but you can see, I hope, this cover, which is in, in Claire's background <laughs> more visibly, uh, is Priyanka de Sousa's uh, brilliant cover of herself um, lying down. And there's uh, sort of a geometric red, green, white, black 
uh, yellow pattern um, there, uh, Priyanka is herself disabled. And I think that confronting people with someone who is resting <laughs> is really important in this time. And I feel like during the pandemic, we're all, um, people are being forced to learn what we in the disabled community have kind of always been forced to learn, which is to be really attuned to our body minds. What are we feeling? What are we thinking? How do we sit with ourselves or lie down with ourselves? Um, and to bring that to translation as a, as a sort of a bodily act to bring all of those sort of pauses and silences and cadences is, is, is something that I think is really important um, to have the chronically ill perspective on words and, and poetry making. Um, so I think that one thing that I wanna point out about this issue is that we were very lucky to get submissions from, um, and to solicit also submissions from various sign languages. In this case, French sign language, the Ben Bescardes, there's British sign language, um, uh, you know, with Sahira Khan and, and DL Williams and, um, Apologies if I've forgotten anyone here. There's also ASL, American Sign Language, by Raymond Lushak, uh, the poet. And then there's uh, Bisindo, which is the sort of Indonesian lingua franca sign language, uh, by Raka Nur Mujahid. So we have four different sign languages in this in this in this issue, which I'm so proud of. Um, and what it really got me thinking also about the concept of gloss. So um, as you'll read in the issue, ASL gloss, for instance, is sort of the the way that Raymond Lukshak, um uh, transform sign language into written language, but it's not standardized. So that in itself is, you know, even the way you translate signs is not standardized, and that goes for each sign language. And I found that absolutely fascinating. And um, I think that deaf and disabled translation practices also open up a whole new set of questions about ethics. Um, and with access to translation, you know, hopefully this will spur people to think about, you know, literary events being translated into sign languages as a form of art in and of itself. These sign language interpreters are artists as well. Um, and, and also to have, uh, you know, uh, more respect for the, the worldviews that we have, because I think as, as Jamie quoted um, the, the incredible Alice Wong, you know, disabled people are modern day oracles. We've lived this in our lives. We, have a vision of how the world could be. And I, I'm so excited that we get to sort of explore this vision in, in this issue. So thanks. You were saying earlier, what are your hopes hopes for this issue, I suppose, as a starting point? Um, I hope this will give more deaf and disabled and chronically ill poets and translators um, in various locations, a sense of relief <laughs> that you're not alone because especially as chronically ill people, as Jamie and I know well, we are constantly translating our bodies in the form of having to give people access, need information, which can be quite violent in and of itself, um, figuring out who to reveal what very personal bodily information to and constantly being misunderstood and disbelieved. Um, and I think that there's, I don't know where I got this quote from, but. I like to say it a lot, it's go where the love is. And I hope that this issue can be a source of, you know, like, oh, that's where the love is. I can I can work through poetics. I can be understood in poetics. I can be translated in po disability and deaf poetics in a way that is like subtle and granular and attentive and kind. Um, because it's certainly been, a, you know, a source of solace for myself and, and perhaps for Jamie as well. So that's one thing that I do hope. But I think there's also something of the future in this that so often as deaf and disabled people, we have to create things for ourselves because nowhere else will do it. Um, as Oka knows well with editing Stairs and Whispers, which was, I believe, the first sort of UK based collection of work by deaf and disabled poets. And as I've learned through trying to build arts nights, that the only way of creating these spaces has long seemed to be for it to be us that are creating them. If we want a magazine that gravitates and centres on this experience, it has to be our magazine. And so I think a big hope for me is that other magazines can see that just as a magazine of translation can actually be centred in these experiences, so can other 
other theme spaces, other organisations, other directions, that we don't just have to create it for ourselves any longer. Yes, amen to that. Wonderful, thank you um, so much um, to all of tonight's poets and, and, and thank you, thank you, Oka and Jamie. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, honour and uh, learning experience working with you. And um, I think this is a really, really special issue. I hope um, those who've watched this will order a copy, um, subscribe to MPT, um, but also you can you can buy the individual copy. Um, it's absolutely full of riches and I think it will expand your mind. Um, and I'll see everyone again, hopefully um, in the summer for what will be my final issue as editor. Um, and it's gonna be a Somali issue, which I'm very excited about. So um, look out for that. And thank you everyone for your support for Modern Poetry and Translation. Um, good night. Thank you.